Um, hi everyone, welcome to this webinar organised by Sage Publishing. Uh, it's great to see so many people joining us uh, for this today. Um, it's, it's the anniversary of lockdown here in the UK and I think it's quite nice to spend it doing something that is maybe one of the few good things that have come out of this new existence of ours, which is the mass Zoom webinar, um, which I think is quite a positive change. Today we're going to be talking about how far-right discourse has seeped into mainstream political agendas. Um, the obvious example I think for most of us will be some of the more shocking statements made by Donald Trump during his presidency in the US regarding immigration and immigrants in particular. Um, but today we're going to be taking a bit of a longer, broader view of this um, to show that the roots of the problem trace back further and deeper than Trump or Brexit, for example, here in the UK. It's a much longer story. We'll be exploring how the rhetoric of the far right has been creeping its way into our politics for some time. Um, that's thanks to various governments, um, the media and different societal pressures. Our speakers today have all written books on this broad theme, coming at it from a variety of angles. Um, so each will be able to bring something a bit different to the discussion. So first today we'll be hearing from Ruth Wodak, who is Emirata Distinguished Professor of Discourse Studies at Lancaster University. She's the author of The Politics of Fear, The Shameless Normalization of Far-Right Discourse. Next up will be Barry Axford, who is Professor Emeritus in Politics at Oxford Brookes University. He's a specialist in global theory, processes of globalization and the mediatization of politics. And his latest book is called Populism versus the New Globalization. Then we'll be hearing from a pair of academics who've teamed up on a book together. They're Aaron Winter, who's Senior Lecturer in Criminology at the University of East London, and Aurelia Mondon, who is Senior Lecturer in Politics at the University of Bath. Their book together is called Reactionary Democracy, How Racism and the Populist Far Right Became Mainstream. So each of our speakers is going to present to us for about 10 minutes, and then we should have about half an hour, maybe a little bit longer left afterwards for all of your questions. You can drop questions throughout the session in the Q&A box. Chat function is off, but the Q&A is on. Um, leave them in there as we go, and then we'll round them up and, and I'll put them to our speakers on your behalf at the end. Um, a little bit of advice would be to keep them short if you can. I think what we've learned over the past year is that uh, it can be a bit difficult to navigate a very lengthy uh, Zoom discussion. So the more succinct you are, the more chance you are that your question is going to be asked at the end. Um, so without further ado, let's get cracking. Our first speaker is Ruth. Shall I hand over to you now, Ruth? Yes. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Do you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. So thank you very much for organizing uh, this most in interesting event and also for inviting me to participate. Uh, I think it's great that we all participate from different uh, countries and I'm right now, I'm sitting in Vienna. Uh, our lockdown has been much longer than the British lockdown started later. And we're still in a lockdown and uh, maybe the lockdown will still continue for another three weeks. Uh, the government is discussing this. So uh, no end of this insecurity. And of course it also plays and has a huge impact on the far right, uh, which I have not covered in my book because basically that happened after all our books went into press. And uh, my take on this issue, this very complex issue is actually that we could probably write a new chapter every day. Uh, I mean, some, some things are a pattern and some things are recurring, but there are also new aspects and of course, new sociopolitical uh, uh, contingencies happening, which uh, lead to new developments. So I would like to just say a few words on my book. It's the second edition of uh, the book which appeared 2015, but it's completely revised and extended. It has a new chapter on illiberalism and Hungary and uh, several other new sections, which I will talk about. And you might want to know why a second edition and already after five years, well, that's exactly not difficult to explain because the world between 2014, 
and 2020 changed in very many ways. Uh, I took as beginning and end of my empirical investigation, the two European Parliament elections, 2014 and 2019. I think um, Aaron and Aurelion have 2014, so I have extended to 2019 to be able to compare what happened in this uh, period with the far right. And uh, I'm also not focused on Donald Trump. I have lots of examples, and of course, Donald Trump is salient in this whole debate. But the far right, and I talk, I'm talking about far right populism, not about left wing populism. I think it's very important to distinguish between different kinds of populisms. I have a whole chapter dedicated to that. And I will only talk about the far right now, but of course we can discuss what's the difference between left wing, how did this start uh, after 1945 in South America and so forth. I think it's important to know the history. And for me, it's also important to uh, emphasize, um, especially coming from Austria, that we know the far right populists since the end of the 1940s. Uh, basically, the so-called VDU, that was the um, alliance of independence, was the successor party of the Nazi party, uh, and uh, that was founded 1949. And that uh, alliance then transformed into the Austrian Freedom Party in the 50s, and ever since, we have been confronted with a far-right populist party. Famously, Jörg Haider in 1989 uh, already got 27% of the votes in a national election. And interestingly, Austria is not talked about much, but it became a symbol of far-right populism in Europe. The same Marine Le Pen or Jean-Marie Le Pen in France. So we have at least two very long situated far-right populist parties in the European Union and Europe, uh, which have a long history going back to post-war and, of course, to pre-1945 post, uh, uh, various uh, uh, ideological uh, strands. So what, what are the big changes between 2014 and 2019? Well, of course, we all know Brexit and Donald Trump. But there are also some other positive changes. I just want to mention Fridays for Future, or that the, in Spain, the conservative government uh, made way to a social democratic government that the left-wing populist party what became part of this government. So Europe, and if you look at all these uh, various uh, member states of the EU or beyond, it's not one size fits all. That's very important to me. Uh, the historical and sociopolitical contexts have actually led to very different um, far right populist parties and very different kinds of ways these parties um, cope with various issues. So uh, apart from uh, such more positive and then, of course, many negative issues like the financial crisis, the so-called refugee movement, especially the latter had an enormous impact on the rise of the far right in Europe. And uh, in that way, you can see uh, not only Brexit, which, of course, my British colleagues know much more about, uh, but which already with the so-called ban story of uh, had it started much earlier, uh, but uh, we can see that um, these issues uh, led to also you know, had a big impact on Donald Trump and what is now called Trumpism, which also did not just fall out of the sky uh, very suddenly. Uh, there are also other issues like Black Lives Matters, um, so we are confronted with very different and contradictory um, uh, tendencies. And I think that's important. Now, what is sort of a major characteristic of the far right? That is nativism. Uh, 
uh, which of course is linked to exclusionary rhetoric, to uh, racism, anti-Semitism, homophobia, xenophobia, and, uh, and all the exclusionary um, uh, policies. It's not just discourse, but discourse which leads to policies. And my basic argument in this book is that from a sort of in the marginal position of some of these parties, others have already been uh, parts of governments in Denmark, in Austria, and so forth. Suddenly, uh, the unsayable became sayable. Uh, politicians did not even have to apologize anymore. So if Donald Trump says, well, he can do anything, even kill somebody on uh, Fifth Avenue and nothing will happen, that's true. Nothing would have happened, uh, I claim, and nothing happens if politicians lie, uh, which is also not new. Politicians have always lied, but now they do it in a way that they, even if they're caught telling falsehoods, it doesn't matter. And uh, this anything goes uh, has become kind of a leitmotif uh, in many of uh, the public spheres, uh, also, of course, uh, supported by some of the media, not all, of course. And I discuss this uh, extensively in my book, also giving examples really of dialogues, of interaction, of slogans, of posters, uh, how this unsayable suddenly becomes sayable or visibilized. Um, I just want to mention three more aspects which might be interesting then for the discussion, uh, that the Eastern Europe has a very different history than Western Europe, and we should not be astonished by uh, the, the transformation of democracies now in uh, Poland and Hungary. Uh, and there's a lot to be said about uh, having experienced two totalitarian regimes uh, and having experienced one totalitarian regime in much of Europe or no totalitarian regime like the UK or the States. So I think we need to make big, uh, really look at the differences between East and West. Uh, the second point is the politics of memory. It's most important as a, the war or a symbolic politics, which has become, uh, has come at the center of debates, not only in Poland, where it's much discussed, but also in other countries, uh, sort of building new uh, national identities, uh, make America great again, going back to something which actually never existed, but that is the imaginary. Um, I think this is most important to look at this politics of memory. And the third point I want to make uh, in this, um, first introductory statement, uh, if I do have still one minute or something, thank you, uh, is uh, gender politics. Gender politics has become another most important aspect of the far right. Again, not with Trump. It didn't start with Trump, it started much earlier. If you look at the German IFD, for example, uh, that which is also homophobic, uh, where you also have an ideology that German women, again, should get many German children. Uh, like in Hungary, there's even a law imposed now that Hungarian women should stay at home and get many Hungarian kids. So you have a sort of comeback of the blood and soil ideology in many ways, uh, a very nativist ideology which of course then excludes many people from this so-called folk, from this uh, people, yeah, but in a hered hereditary uh, uh, meaning. And I think this is most important to understand the politics of exclusion. Uh, and for example, if the IFD in Germany says Islam does not belong to Germany, then that means, you know, uh, they are, even if they have citizenship, they don't belong to Germany. Uh, we have a similar debate in Austria, uh, also concerning other ethnicities, other minorities, like the Jews. Uh, 
So anti-Semitism has not disappeared and has not been substituted by uh, anti-Muslim sentiments. They frequently come together. And so you see uh, George Soros uh, being extraordinarily powerful, uh, having all the puppets on the strings, which are the Muslim refugees which are coming into Hungary. So we have a combination of uh, the world conspiracy theories with anti-Muslim sentiments and exclusionary rhetoric. And not only in Hungary, we see that with Salvini, we see that with many other uh, politicians, also Donald Trump, by the way. So all in all, uh, my argument, my overall argument is there is enormous change, of course, not only discursively, but also in politics. And this kind of shameless normalization, which means you don't apologize, it's anything goes, yeah, you can do anything you want, you can be rude, uh, whatever, uh, facilitates the implementation of very conservative policies. So you're distracted by discussing all these uh, terrible utterances uh, and these, this breaking of taboos at the same time many policies are implemented which actually um, sort of localize and determine these restrictive policies. And we have been watching this sort of playing together of provocation, scandalization, and then implementation of policies all the time. Uh, a, a small example, in Austria, you all, the politicians always talk about the headscarf, always falls from somewhere um, and we don't need women with headscarves uh, and the headscarf is a symbol of evil uh, and uh, traditional gender roles and all of that uh, islam and so forth uh, barbarians backwardness and so forth at the same time this the government implemented laws for longer working hours which of course met uh, sort of had an influence on many, many uh, people of their electorate. But that was not talked about. What was talked about was the headscarf. And that's a recurring pattern. And I might just make a first stop here. Thank you very much. That's great. Thank you so much, Ruth. There's lots to chew over in, in there. And um, we'll move on now to Barry, if, if you're ready. I am. Uh, thank you, Laura, and, and, th and thank you, Ruth. I'd like, just like to say that it's a, it's a privilege to share a platform um, with experts in this area. I feel myself to be a parvenu in this respect. My remit uh, more generally and in this talk is, is, is rather broader and wider. In particular, I'm going to talk a little bit about the argument presented in my new book, Populism versus the New Globalization. And in more condensed form in the introduction to the forthcoming 37th volume of Proto-Sociology, which is co-written with Manfred Steger. I want to draw attention to the implication of and tensions between what I and a whole host of others as well actually call postmodern populism and a new phase of globalization of necessity, I suppose. I can't offer a nuanced account of these two concepts here. But I will hint at what various accommodations and tensions between the two portend for the temper of contemporary politics, both within and across states and societies, ending with the questions, are, or even the question, are there reasons to be cheerful? First, then, let's agree that there are deep-seated as well as longer-term causes of the mainstreaming of extremism, and perhaps of all unusual brands of, of, uh, of contentious politics and forms of political mobilization. But for illustrative purposes, I'm going to start with a more immediate and local context, which is in fact the American context. While it is true that Brexit and Trump did not cause the recent populist surge, there's no doubt, I think, that the narrative of populism as a rising tide has enjoyed more currency since the Donald's election in 2016 and the success of the Leave campaign in the UK referendum. And yet, on the eve, you may recall this, on the eve of what proved to be Trump's election defeat some four years later, the British journalist Nick Cohen felt able to muse, quote, we're endlessly told why populism works, now see how it might fail, close quotes. So one might be forgiven, yeah, you might be forgiven for thinking that what goes wrong must at some point come around. 
However, things are not that simple. Making the runes harder to read, I think. Trump duly lost the presidential election, but at the same time harvested the votes of nearly 75 millions of the US electorate. And his yield of the ballot box turned out to be larger and more diverse than liberal wishful thinking had entertained. The even more sober, in fact, I suppose, bearing those sort of figures in mind, is that many of his supporters seem in it for the long run, or at least they say that they are. And that's a more telling datum, maybe a pointer to something profound and unsettling still in train, possibly about the mainstream of extremism or reactionary politics on a grand, even global scale. For students of American and world politics, as well as for citizens more generally, the burden of these events has yet to unfold. However, one thing seems to be beyond doubt. Whether you describe Trump as a full spectrum populist or an aspirational fascist, as William Connolly did in 2018, his rise and maybe his fall tell us that the temper and successes of populisms are massively inflected by two things. First, by local circumstances and conditions, and second, by the fact that we are living through what Manfred Steger and Paul James call, and I'm quoting again, globalization's most uneven and disjunctive phase in human history. Close quotes. Both facts tell us to beware the one size fits all motif applied to the causes and consequences, and indeed the manner of populist incursions. The link between globalization and populism is the primary theme of my new book. Populism is a global phenomenon that possesses world-making and world-sundering potential. Though its impact is often subject to hyperbole, its potential as a disruptor of usual politics cannot be dismissed. And along with other factors, the mainstream of extreming discourses at this time underlines its facile appeal. Moreover, the new wave of right-wing populisms, sorry, my screen is jumping around in front of me here, now it's stabilized, unlike world politics. Moreover, the new wave of white wing, right wing national populism is intricately connected to shifting perceptions of the role of globalization in the world and musters as a renewed focus on and valorization of the national imaginary. For years, far right extremists trafficked ideology and sought friends on society's fringes and in the darker realms of the web. Nowadays, national populism is found everywhere and anywhere although I recognize that may be a contentious statement. Yet although its ubiquity is a sign of its global geographical reach through digital media, it also exposes a paradox. For denunciation of globalization and globalism notwithstanding, populism has itself become part of a multidimensional process that cuts across national borders and cultural lines of demarcation, while still presenting itself as their antithesis. So there can be no doubt that populism and globalization are shorthand for the temper of our times. In this arena, populism is usually cast as globalization's rude nemesis, a backlash against worldwide connectivity and the demise of borders of all kinds, while globalization is often said to be in retreat or even demise. In the book, I take issue with both interpretations, claiming instead that while populism of all shades tends to be anti-globalist, the globalism it is, or if you prefer, they are, pitted against has changed dramatically in recent years, and it's increasingly decentered, de destabilized, contingent, multipolar, multidirectional, and moreover valorizes what many people are calling sovereignism, an elemental regard for taking back control of things. I call this combination of features and a new globalization, uh, which is a hostage to fortune, but nonetheless, that's what I've done. A strain confronted and accommodated by populism in its postmodern guise, an incarnation of both contests the new globalization and yet is its expression. Attention to the current spate of populism thus affords purchase on an axial feature of our turbulent world, which is also globalized, the implication or antithesis of local and global and of difference and sameness. So the so-called populist explosion in recent years has to be said in a global politics of anger and revolt that intensified in the wake of the 2008 global financial crisis and European sovereign debt crisis. It is an off-the-shelf vehicle of dissent, though often bruited as a new kind of politics, one promising a radical solution for the ills attributed to a global cultural economy of relativism and a history of bad faith by political, cultural and economic elites. In the larger scheme of things, it is part of the crisis of modernity, in a much larger scheme of things, it's part of the crisis of modernity. 
under the recently dominant model of market globalization, especially in its neoliberal guise. Sorry, my screen is again jumping about, but it's back to equilibrium. In many places, it manifests as an anti-global and largely defensive nationalism, sometimes spiced with crude nativism and xenophobia. In fact, it is all these things and more. Disporting as the clouds and be signifier, the politics of populism may indeed prove to be a hiatus before usual politics resumes. But it can also be glossed as a transformative moment in the constitution of 21st century globality, an exemplar of the playing out of the elemental and sometimes tortuous dialectic of local and global, of modern and postmodern, along with some echoes of pre-modern, shades here of Latour's land of old. Populist politics, Sorry, my screen is again bouncing around. Populist politics is thus a phenomenon of these unsettled times, increasingly modal, albeit with variable purchase on hearts and minds. It's a salutary reminder of the abiding visceral power of, of place, the particular and the imagined exception in global constitution. But are there reasons to be cheerful? To reiterate, a seemingly resilient anti-globalist strain of right-wing populism has been born over the past couple of decades responding to the turbulence caused by the successes and failures of market globalization and its political and cultural avatars. Its ascent confirms the destabilization of once taken for granted shibboleths, including the central importance of unfettered markets, fluid borders, and the desirability of cosmopolitan elitism. Today's condition, which Steger and James called the great unsettling, brings traditional right-wing populism into a sometimes uneasy alliance with the outright, anarcho-capitalists, religious fundamentalists, conspiracy theorists, and even, I suppose, some anti-vaxxers. So to go back to my initial local context in the USA, we now have the spectre of two Americas, one Trumpist, perennially angry, and at the extreme even secessionist, I suppose, the other clinging to the rack of liberal ideals while trying to negotiate the demands of identity politics. And this condition may beggar both platitudes about reconciliation and earnest attempts at redress, such as those expressed in Biden's inauguration speech and visible in his $2 trillion COVID rescue package. But on, but on the wider stage, but on the wider stage, only some of this is a simple atavistic response to out there global forces or the desire for a selective autarky that traffics a nativist and exclusionary slant on migration, job protection and the preservation of cultural identity. Even if the rhetoric of populists suggests exactly that. Populists often reveal ambivalence rather than coherence of identity and it is as well to bear this in mind. Of course, there are other perhaps more somber markers of the temper of populist interventions for all its embrace of absolutes like the people and use of them as a stick with which to beat opponents, the modus operandi of populist politics is to corrode inclusive definitions of membership and universal protections, those givens, if you will, of liberal democratic politics. Erosion of trust in the routines of elite succession, in the rule of law and in the mainstream media, whatever that is today, as a stalwart of the public sphere, cleave to illiberal forms of rule, even championing, championing the antonymic idea of a liberal democracy. So as I noted earlier, paradoxically, while being the self-proclaimed nemesis of neoliberal globalization, populism is a symptom of what is or may be globalization's neoliberal and sovereignist phrase. This mix and the politics it spawns plays differently across the world, but always coheres around perceived loss of identity, status, dignity, voice, respect, and of course, economic well-being. While playing to different cultural scripts in particular localities, and producing more or less disagreeable politics to boot. These are modal issues and pointers towards long-term, large-scale global change. So Leclerc's empty signifier aspirism, which saw populism as a kind of pro-tem arrangement, while real politics dust itself down, also admits a more challenging and likely more worrying interpretation of the phenomenon and its effects. In this interpretation, it is not a variant of usual politics or a periodic feature of systems that are disturbed while still tending to equilibrium, but a global moment in the disruption and transformation of modern life. One last paragraph. The problem for populist leaders, even successful ones, is what to do with public cynicism and anger once they tap into it. How to pick up the emotional slack and fashion a sustainable platform that goes beyond nationalist rhetoric, anti-governmentalism, thinly disguised racism and fundamentalist anthems of various hue. Only when that question is answered, I think, 
the screen is bouncing a bit. Only when that question is answered, I think, uh, will we be able to assess whether we're talking about a global movement in the disruption and transformation of modern politics, indeed of modern life. And of course, the COVID-19 pandemic has a whole new dimension to these questions. Thank you. Thanks very much, Barry, that's great. Um, right, quickly, we'll move on to Aaron. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Um, so the violent storming of the Capitol uh, by a loose-knit but seemingly well-organized mob of Trump supporters, um, including followers of the Proud Boys, um, QAnon, and the unaffiliated, encouraged by the president himself on 6th of January, caused shock and raised serious questions. One of the big questions asked was, what does this attack say about America and American democracy? And who or what did they represent? Were they an exception, fringe extremists, or part of a wider, even endemic problem and threat? Or were they also part of a wider democratic constituency, one that had been, to quote, left behind? President-elect Joe Biden uh, himself attempted to answer this question or these questions in his statement that day. To quote, let me be very clear. The scenes of chaos at the Capitol do not reflect the true America. This is not who we are. What we are seeing is a small number of extremists dedicated to lawlessness. This is not dissent, it is disorder. It is chaos, it borders on sedition. I am shocked and saddened that our nation, a long beacon, long, so long a beacon of hope, light, hope and democracy has come to such a dark moment. And America is about honor, decency, respect, and tolerance. That is who we are. That is who we've always been. We saw Biden do a variation on this during the campaign, describing his decision to run. In Charlottesville, we saw Klansmen, white supremacists, and neo-Nazis come out into the open. Their crazed faces illuminated by torches, veins bul bul sorry, bulging, and bearing the fangs of racism chanting the same anti-Semitic bile heard across Europe in the 30s. And they were met by a courageous group of Americans and a violent clash ensued and a brave young woman lost her life. The former quote, American, has exceptional, American exceptionalism rearing its head to the point that it was not only clear of its history and legacy of racism, slavery, Jim Crow and white settler colonialism, but also fascism in the, and the far right in its own history. The latter quote, although coming earlier chronologically, renders fascism in the far right foreign and opposition to it American. It also ignores how mainstream the far right and their ideas have become. Now, it is important to acknowledge the magnitude of the attack, as well as the growing threat with violent and deadly implications. Reported and recognized by anti-fascists, academic researchers, monitoring groups, the FBI and Homeland Security but we should reject constructions that limit it to Trump or Trumpism, even if we are happy to see the back of him or limit the problem and one problem specifically racism to the far or extreme right or sideline discussion of these and discussion of the role of the mainstream itself because of the distracting function of extremism. In reactionary democracy, Aurelian and I look at the mainstreaming of racism in the far right through a range of discourses and processes. The first is the way in which the far right and right wing extremism and terrorism have played a role as an illiberal or extremist foil in liberal and conservative narratives about racial progress and the denial of systemic racism in Western liberal democracies, America being one. It is the other to liberal colorblind progressive democratic societies that must be held up as an example of the monster at the door, but kept outside by any means necessary. And these means can be twofold uh, or more. One is repressive exceptionalizing counter extremism and counter terrorism discourses, narratives and policies and practices, but also ironically mainstreaming. As at the same time as the far extreme right is a foil it is also increasingly being legitimized and mainstreamed through both pseudo-sociological and pseudo-populist attribution of racist positions to the working class, the left behind, and democracy as the will of the people or demos, and the belief that such ideas must be platformed and taken on board by establishment parties um, and media 
to gain their support, be democratic and liberal, and fend off the more illiberal and dangerous far or extreme right. Now in the book, we develop a series of concepts and together a conceptual toolkit, if you will, to understand not only the current conjuncture, but its historical development prior to Trump or Brexit. One set of concepts are liberal versus illiberal articulations of racism. The second is the mainstreaming of the far right. And the third um, is the populist hype and construction of the people. And it, it's these that we're gonna focus on here. Um, now, illiberal racism for us is the popular definition of real racism or what people use in popular rhetoric and narratives that of old fashioned historical traditional racism that has been defeated or a remnant of it that ended in Europe with World War II and the defeat of the Nazis, the victory of the liberal and li victory of the liberal democratic order, America in the 1960s and South Africa later. We only keep their monuments and memorials. It can also manifest or, or, or be seen in and identified with slavery and colonialism if colonialism is taken, is acknowledged and condemned uh, by societies. And we, we know that is not the case in many. Uh, Jim Crow segregation, biological science, uh, race science, um, fascism, genocide, racist violence, and as a remnant of traditional forms, uh, the contemporary extreme and far right. And these are seen as racisms that are no longer acceptable, having been defeated, or no out of time and out of place in liberal democracies. Um, now, liberal racism are contemporary forms of racism that distinguish themselves by not being illiberal or real racism. In that sense, illiberal racism is a functional concept to legitimize liberal democracy and racism, treating liberalism as the antidote or bulwark against racism, denying the racism within liberalism, as well as the lack of action in liberal societies on structural inequalities and the continuity of less overt forms of systemic encoded racism. Um, it often uses the threat of the far right to push moderate politicians and policies, including structurally racist ones, or maintain the status quo. For example, to illustrate, Biden being constructed as a left liberal bulwark against racism and extremism. This was affirmed by Biden himself on the day of the storming of the Capitol and the campaign, uh, as noted earlier. It is interesting that it was not even Trump's own racist policies on immigration and bordering that were the basis for opposition. In the push to oppose Trump's overt racism and fascist fascism um, and get an electable centrist candidate, Biden's record on systemic racism gets less attention as well. Significant if you consider the impact of the 1994 crime bill that partly informs Black Lives Matter's critique of systemic racism. In 2018, Hillary Clinton herself made the argument in The Guardian that Europe needs to curb immigration to stop right-wing populists, thereby accepting their ideas and potential supporters as a larger democratic constituency such statements and political calculations seem to buy into the left behind and populism narratives and also raise the question of what they're actually against if they claim to oppose racists in the far right. This limits the horizon of critique and of anti-racism. And it may actually be the function of liberal racism or illiberal racism. I would also note the same trick was used by Nigel Farage but for the far right against the extreme right, noting or quoting, I destroyed the British National Party. We had a far right party in this country who genuinely were anti-Jew, anti-Black and all those things, noting he is not saying Muslims are migrants. And I came along and said to their voters, if you're holding your nose and voting for this party's protest, don't come and vote for me. Now, liberal racism also uses illiberal racism to represent the present as a better place, a la post-race colorblind and progressive prog progress narratives that the far right and racism were defeated with civil rights or Obama's election, for example, and serve up examples of the Nazis, the Klan in the third civil, third civil rights era or the National Front in the 1970s in Britain um, as the defeat of, you know, we're not in days that are as bad as that. And often what occurs is this serves to deny and diminish 
systemic racism, but also people's um, experiences at the sharp end of racism. Liberal racism also individualizes racism. It treats it as an individual or aberration. Racists are bad apples displaced from the system itself. And this is interesting because it not only includes hate crime and far-right terrorism, but often police, institutional, and state racism are also rendered um, exception or the, 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 the doings of bad apples, um, which is quite ironic when we're talking about institutional and state racism. It also operates through weaponized liberal tropes, LGBTQ plus rights, women's rights, and free speech, often weaponized against Muslims. And this plays a significant role in mainstreaming. Now, that's not to say that liberal and liberal racism are or articulations of racism are absolutely distinct. In fact, as I noted, that illiberal racism is a functional concept that allows liberal racism to not only sort of fester and develop and gain more legitimacy, but also mainstreams the more illiberal or far right ones. And because often because of these blurry boundaries or because they make it acceptable. Now, the way these boundaries can be blurred is, for example, liberal platforming and debating racists and the far right under the auspices of free speech and the construction of equivalence. Because now if racism is over, all sides are equal. Um, the defense of monuments to illiberal racism and attacking opposition to it. This would include liberal attacks on Black Lives Matter, um, Antifa, the 1619 Project, for um, denying or trampling on history, even as an educational opportunity. Um, another way the boundaries are blurred is representing the far right and anti-racism as equivalent, or the latter as racist and extremists, which may also unleash an illiberal response from the state, elected officials and the police, and its supporters on the far right who are emboldened and protected, something we saw in the comparison between um, the policing of the storming of the Capitol and the Black Lives Matter uh, protests. We also see this in crackdowns on left anti-racist and feminist protest and opposition in the UK, for example, in the form of the police response, but also the police crime sentencing and courts bill 2021 by a state that is rallied against such movements and constituencies as woke, left authoritarian and threatening to cancel British history and um, well, reactionary uh, voices of democracy. Um, the other way it, it, the, the boundaries are blurred is because liberals can often share commitments with the far right. Um, and, the main, and this allows for mainstreaming, um, anti-wokeness and anti-identity politics. People, liberals uttering these concepts of cancel culture um, ignoring the way or allowing um, or accepting the way it comes from reactionary and far-right forces, free speech and history. And I'm going to leave it there and um, we'll move on to the next concepts. Thank you. Thanks so much, Aaron. And here's Aurelia to fill us in with the rest of that book. Thank you. Uh, I just want to then uh, mention briefly the, the next two concepts in the books that we touched on. The first one's mainstreaming, and then I'll talk briefly about the populist hype. The first thing I want to insist on really, and that we insist on in the book is to understand mainstreaming as a, as a fluid concept, um, as a construct, as something that is contingent uh, and something, as I said, that is fluid, something that moves, that is not set in stone. It is also something that is not essentially good uh, and something that is not essentially progressive and that progress is not inevitable and it is precarious. Uh, what we argue in the book is that for too long there's been this idea that liberalism in a way was leading us towards progress and it might be slow and it might be too slow for many people but eventually we would get there, we would get gender equality, we would get equality for various people but this would happen, there would be little setbacks. What we argue is that this view of mainstream of the mainstream and this view of progress has been very unhelpful and has helped with the mainstreaming of far-right politics. Therefore it is essential to see mainstreaming as a dynamic process. The other thing that we need to think about when we think about mainstreaming is that too often we assume that the mainstreaming process works through the sole agency of the far right, with them being either media or internet savvy, think about social media, for example, and so on, or cunning, or even tapping, uh, as Aaron talked about, in, uh, into legitimate grievances, the fact that the people are anti-immigration, the people want sovereignty, the people want closed borders, and so on and so forth. Of course, in this kind of way of looking at the mainstreaming process, 
based on the far right's agency, there is an element of voyeurism there and a reassuring feeling, in fact, uh, that it is others who steal our enjoyment of liberal democracy. If only it wasn't for the far right or the so-called populists, and by extension, the people who uh, support uh, this kind of, who have this ir irrational pension for off right and politics, then we would be fine, we could enjoy liberal democracy. However, what we argue is that this ignores that the discursive power remains predominantly anchored in the hands of the mainstream itself and mainstream elites in particular, and that the mainstreaming process requires either the failure of mainstream elite uh, actors or their complicity. So what we look at in the book, but also more recently with, uh, with Katie Brown, is uh, the way our traditional mainstream media, political and intellectual elite, have managed to divert attention away from their responsibility in creating or compounding the many crises we face, and also their incapacity to respond to them properly without actually putting the blame onto someone else, whether the far right or the people and their irrational voting patterns. Instead, what we argue is that mainstream actors have diverted attention onto the far right as an exaggerated scarecrow. Don't get me wrong here. Of course, we should be worried about the far right. The far right is extremely dangerous and the people at the sharp end of their politics are already suffering. And as Ruth Vodak has said before, have suffered at their hands for quite a long time. This is nothing new. The far right has been a danger and a threat for a long time. But what we're arguing in the book is that this threat to some extent has been exaggerated to justify the position of mainstream elite by claiming to be a bulwark against such politics. And therefore that them staying in power was sufficient enough uh, for the fact that we would prevent the far right from getting in power. Think, for example, of the Washington Post's motto uh, after Trump's election, democracy dies in darkness, as if the traditional media had not participated in making the situation what it was in 2016, as if the traditional media had no role uh, to, to have played in uh, the, the wave of disinformation, post-truth, uh, and the way we looked at politics, uh, and the way we looked at alternatives, both left and right. One of the key processes that we look at to understand the mainstream, how mainstreaming has taken place is what we call uh, populist hype that uh, Aaron mentioned before. Populist hype in a nutshell is the overuse uh, and wide misuse of the term populism in our media, politi uh, political, but also academic landscape. Uh, and we argue that this has three main consequences. The first one is the overuse and misuse of populism has euphemized the politics of so-called populist parties on the right, taking away from more accurate, but also more stigmatizing terms, such as far right, extreme right, or even fascist. As we've seen recently, fascist, in fact, can, can be quite, quite, a, um, quite an, an appropriate term. Uh, and uh, Ruth was talking about the AFD before, and, uh, and one, one of the leaders of the AFD, one of the original leaders of the AFD, Hawker, was, uh, was actually, uh, we are allowed to call him a fascist according to a court decision, which is, which is quite fascinating. But again, you will see a lot of mainstream newspapers who will not call him a fascist, not even extreme right, and instead simply call him a populist or anti-immigration, which we argue is euphemizing their politics and how dangerous these are. You can also think, for example, of the coverage of Steve Bannon in the Guardian newspaper in the UK. Uh, the second day of the uh, Guardian uh, series on the new populism that started in 2018, four articles were dedicated to Steve Bannon who was trying to make his way into European politics. Already everybody knew it was a failure, the newspaper knew it was a failure, and yet they dedicated four articles, giving him a platform, but also giving him a full interview where he could say that he wanted to, uh, I think, put a state through the heart of Brussels. The second point, so the first one is euphemization. The second point is legitimization. It legitimizes calling parties like the, the Rassemblement National in France, UKIP in the UK, the, the FPO in, in Australia, and so on, calling them populist, or Donald Trump populist, legitimizes their ideas and politics by making, by making them appear as the alternative to the status quo, the alternative to an elite that is widely distrusted, and some quite often for very good reasons. Um, but it also, it also legitimizes them by making them appear as if they were supported by the people through the semantic link constructed and created by the term populism. At the root of populism is the people, at the root of democracy is the people. And this is why you have people like Marine Le Pen who says, well, if you want to call me a populist, then fine, I am a populist if that means representing the people. Of course, Marine Le Pen threatened a few years ago to sue anyone who would call her party extreme right. And surely that should make us think about the importance of these terms, right? Um, 
This has often served as well to pin the blame on the constructed work, white working class that Aaron talked about before, uh, which has become representative of the people and particularly representative of the people that tends to be behind, apparently, uh, the rise of the far right. And of course, context is very important here, and we need to pay attention to context. And in some contexts, the working class might be more behind certain far right parties. But in the context that Aaron, explore, Aaron and I explore, which is France, the UK, and the US, this is quite simply not true. Or at least it's a very, very skewed vision of elections. For example, we've heard time and time again that the reasons behind Brexit and Donald Trump, but also the rise of the Front National, is that the working class has moved from left to right and is now voting for these reactionaries who are tapping into legitimate grievances. Um, what we argue in the book is that actually this is based on very skewed readings of data. In fact, the, vote, the Brexit vote is very much a wealthy vote. Uh, and of course, there are some working class people who have voted for Brexit. But once we take into account abstention, once we take into account where the vote comes from geographically, we see very quickly that actually the picture of the red wall falling for Brexit is very much a simplification. The same happens with Donald Trump. Donald Trump has been uh, hyped as this person who was uh, propped up to the White House by, uh, by the Rust Belt and uh, pushed by deindustrialization and employment. In fact, if we look at, at the data again, it is very, very clear that the poorer you are in the United States, the more likely you were to vote for Clinton and the more likely you were to vote for, uh, for Biden as well. Uh, and the wealthier you are, the more likely you were to vote for Donald Trump. This should not surprise us at all. Donald Trump does not come from a vacuum. He comes from the Republican Party. He is the candidate of a Republican Party who will be running on a low tax uh, program, which of course will appeal to a certain category of uh, the electorate. This proved just as true in, in 2016 as it did in 2020. Finally, so the first um, element is euphemization of their politics, second legitimization, and the first, third one is that it has prevented us from thinking beyond the liberal status quo and the false alternative that the far right proposes. By pitting the two alternatives at the moment in Western politics, in our democracies, as either populism or us, the status quo, the elite liberal democracy, we have completely failed to think about other ways to actually address the many crises we think and to return to some kind of imagination uh, that should be core to our democratic discussion. Therefore, in this context and in our reactionary moment, uh, what I want to conclude on is what really we argue at the end and in, in our conclusion, which is really that those in position of privileged power when it comes to access to public discourse, which is generally the media, of course, politicians, but also us as academics, we must take a stand uh, as not doing anything at the moment, as pretending that we are above, that we are beyond, that we are unbiased, that we are objective bystanders to the politics that are taking place in front of us, particularly when we study them ourselves or when we cover them or when we're politicians ourselves, can only mean one thing. It means being complicit with the rise of reaction. Uh, what we argue at the end of the book is that there is no choice. Either we are against reaction uh, or we are complicit. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aurelia. And that's given me personally quite a lot of things to think about in the way I cover these issues. Um, conversation. Sorry, I wasn't meant to target you. <laughs> well, I need to ask you for some advice uh, as we approach the French election in particular. <laughs> um, we've got loads of questions coming through, so I don't want to hog um, everyone's time. But I did just want to just track back to Ruth really quickly because you mentioned um, Hungary. And, and that you've, you've actually added a chapter to your book on Hungary specifically. And I think that this is a, a topic that a lot of people sort of feel very kind of background anxious about without really understanding what's going on there at all. I think we all have you know, a much higher level of understanding of, of what happens in the US and what's maybe what's happening in the UK. But I think um, these sort of hotspots of concern in, in Hungary and Poland, and I'm seeing some questions um, on the chat as well about this. Could you tell us just a little bit about what the essentials of what we need to know about what's going on there? based on your research? Well, it's difficult, thank you. It's difficult to condense. And first I would like to say it was great listening to everybody and it really gives a very complex picture of what we're all interested in. And there's so many aspects and dimensions, of course. But uh, now looking at Hungary, uh, I think we, uh, first we have to go back again historically, but then it also has a lot to do uh, with uh, also the protagonists in this sort of uh, uh, moment, political moment there. 
uh, if we go back, uh, you all know that 1989 was the end of the Cold War, the collapse of the Soviet Union, and Hungary and other Eastern European countries, the Eastern Bloc, uh, became sort of part of uh, the free world. Uh, and uh, uh, and it, <clears throat> what happened then was uh, very different kinds of ways to influence the development of these countries from one party systems into capitalist societies. And I won't go into this, but what uh, happened then was that uh, Orban, who uh, already was around at that time and was actually a scholar in Oxford, uh, paid by George Soros, he had a stipend, um, uh, was a liberal and uh, actually formed a party at that time, Fides, uh, which was a liberal party. Many of our colleagues, probably you also know some of them, were part of this party. These were young intellectuals, very interested in new liberal movements, moments in movements in developing Hungary into a different kind of democracy now, et cetera, and so forth. Uh, and, uh, and at a certain point after uh, Hungary joined the EU, the accession was 2004, the big bank, uh, together with Poland, Cyprus, Malta, and so forth and so forth. Um, uh, Hung uh, Orban slowly transformed that party, uh, and that was supported by uh, the collapse of the Social Democratic Party, Socialist Party, and also the successors of the Communist Party because there was a lot of corruption and many scandals. And so the next election, Orban and Fidesz won. And from 2010 on, and that's where I then really go into it in, in this chapter, Orban decided with his party uh, to basically take over the government slowly and also proposed what he says, a illiberal democracy. Now, this might be a very strange term. He defines it as the protector of the Christian Occident. It's very much based on religion. It's a fundamentalist uh, point of view. And he challenges the freedom of press, uh, the freedom of legislation, and uh, started to also uh, substitute various uh, directors of theaters, of cultural institutions, of universities, etc., by some of his supporters. So basically, the country is turning into a Fides block. And also at the next election, through gerrymandering, which was much talked about in the States, was also happened in Hungary. Uh, he didn't win the majority, but the, the, dis the districts were organized in the way that uh, his party has the ma absolute majority in the parliament. So basically, Orban can do anything he wants to do, uh, which was also now during the COVID crisis, he just uh, uh, sort of set the parliament out of action and said, I'm going to take all decisions. I don't need the parliament, which would have supported his decisions anyway, because he has the majority. Uh, and what we now talk about is the way uh, this is all very short summary. Uh, I have left out the anti-Semitism, the anti-Roma uh, uh, and Sinti exclusionary rhetoric uh, against all NGOs. They are uh, clamming down on the NGOs. They have shut the last three radio station, I think three weeks ago, uh, which is all not really reported in the Western media. I don't think that gets much reporting in the UK, although it should, uh, because, and uh, for the EU, that's now my personal also opinion, and I totally agree with Aurelia, we have to take stands, and I've done that, I think, all my life. Um, it's obviously that uh, the way Hungary has gone, and also Poland, is an absolute, uh, contrast to what the EU stands for. 
And uh, the EU with its treaties, with human rights as part of its treaties, uh, with the Geneva Convention, I've not said how refugees are treated with gates and very similar to what is happening at the Mexi happened at the Mexican American border with cages and, and so forth. So um, the racism is extraordinary there and the politics of memory is extraordinary there, but this counteracts everything the EU stands for. Now the EU has started article seven, which is the first step to actually make a member sta uh, state take back and retract on some of this, its legislation. Otherwise they would lose their voting options in some committees, etc. cetera. Uh, but that all takes enormous amounts of time. And so basically, as you said, Aurelia, the EU is complicit because nothing is happening except for the European Court of Human Rights, there's uh, things happening. And uh, I think this is very dangerous because basically what people say, the only thing what, which would impress Fides and Orban would be to cut money. Uh, I don't know if this is true, I'm not an economist and, and so forth, uh, but basically really sanctions uh, because rhetoric does not impress them. And I've analyzed some of the dialogues because this is what I also do in my empirical work. And you see again, this anything goes because Orban doesn't really reply. He doesn't uh, sort of take, he's not accountable. Yeah, he, he's not responsible. He doesn't interact with uh, all these commissioners or whoever, lawyers, etc., politicians, he just sort of avoids talking about it. He takes another level. He's in a completely different world of discourse. And uh, I think for me as a discourse analyst, this is of course most uh, fascinating quote unquote, but it just shows that there is no dialogue anymore. Something actually what you were talking about, what is happening in the States, the polarization, the division in different discourse worlds uh, where people don't interact. Um, there is no dialogue, not even talking about rational dialogue, just no dialogue. And um, now Orban and his party were actually left the European People's Party anyway, very late uh, uh, because they were again, complicit in holding Fides in the European People's Party because their seats were needed for the majority in the European Parliament. So you always have these opportunistic compromises which keep it going. And I think this is, that is a crucial element of uh, why this uh, Hungarian example is so important. But one also has to say that many people adore Orban. Uh, he's spread out lots of money to his followers and family members. There's a, some people say it's kleptocratic regime. Jan Werner Müller says that about Hungary. And uh, uh, on the other hand, this myth of protecting the Occident from an invasion or great replacement uh, and all of that, we are elements of the rhetoric we know from the neo-Nazis, from the identitarians and from the extreme right. And he, Hungary is protecting Europe. It's at the borders to sort of the East. And the, this myth is very, very strong uh, as a narrative uh, in, in the Hungarian public sphere. Thanks, Very so short summary. That's really great, Ruth. I think it's really good to talk about these things because I think, as you said, it's not reported that much in the West, um, but I have certainly seen that readers of our website um, at least are very interested in hearing more about it and want to understand it more. Um, and really, and some of the things that Ruth was saying sort of chart back to what you were talking about, about with, um, falling into complicity with, with these kinds of people. How, how do you see kind of the relationship between the EU and Hungary or what's the kind of better way for us, I'm thinking of myself in the media, but the general public to, 
to confront these issues without becoming complicit. What you said about um, being legally able to call someone a fascist, that for me in my daily work it is a really big problem. I, I, I'm constrained from calling someone a racist by the fear that they will sue me. Um, I don't tend to fall back on terms like populism lazily, um, but we are in the press certainly um, restricted in what we can say by these fears of, of people who you know, are litigious um, very often. So what's your kind of ideal world um, um, from sort of thinking ahead to the French election? What should I be doing as a journalist? What should the general public be doing when we're talking about these issues? Um, well, it's, I mean, it's a very good question and I, and I wish I had the answer to this really, but, um, but it's complicated. And I think, I think it shows in a way how, how much we've, we've slipped towards towards reaction in a way that, that it's become so complicated to talk about things that used to be so easy to talk about. You know, it, it used to be absolutely normal in France to talk about the Front National and Jean-Marie Le Pen as extreme right. You know, I mean, Jean-Marie Le Pen was a revisionist. Uh, he talked about Holocaust denialism quite often. Uh, he made, you know, like a front page on, on these kind of issues. You know, Marine Le Pen uh, might be different. She might be so, more softly spoken, but she's his daughter, right? I mean, you know, she shares the same name. She shared the same party. She's moved on, but quite recently, she she nominated as uh, as the head of one of the lists for the regional election uh, the former uh, spokesperson of uh, Generation Identity, which had, which has just been banned in France, banned by Gérald Darmanin, who is the Home Office Minister in France, who called Marine Le Pen too soft on Islam. So you know, for generation Generation Identitaire to be banned, it, it had to go really far, right? And what does Marine Le Pen do? She nominates the former spokesperson uh, to one of the head uh, of the regional election lists. Um, so, I mean, you know, of course, she's most softly spoken. She's careful with what she says. And in fact, she's more careful than, than even mainstream politicians nowadays. But, but, you know, according to most of us in the field, most academics in the field, she would still um, fit our definitions of extreme right, far right, radical right, uh, quite often more than populist, really, because most of us would argue that there is no such thing as just pure populism in many ways. Uh, and so, so I think that's that's the way to go about it. That's that's about referring back to what actually academics are talking about. What I think has been a big problem um, in uh, in media coverage, but also within politics and academia, in a way, is that we've tended to give far too much space uh, to to reactionaries themselves. You know, in this idea that we need to have debates, uh, and that uh, and this is something that the reactionaries have, have you know uh, really. Um, uh, benefited from and they also used themselves by you know using the term, terms such as free speech the fact that they should be able to say whatever they want anytime they want but of course this is not how free, free speech works right I mean free speech is, is, is a great concept it's very positive it can be very uh, very progressive um, but it needs to be you know equally uh, given to everyone and of course that's not what they want right the far right doesn't want speech to given to everyone they want actually speech so that they can shut down other people's speech and quite often they actually want to dehumanize some people uh, around us so actually they are you know innately against free speech or these politics are innately against free speech but yet they've managed to actually turn the vocabulary around and this is fascinating because this is something that goes back again and that's why it's important to see it as a, as a historical uh, in, in its historical context, because this is something that, and we look at this in the book as well, this is something that starts back in the 60s, 70s, when the far and extreme right are completely marginalized in the post-World uh, War II uh, world, uh, where it is inac uh, unacceptable to be publicly uh, close to fascism, close to Nazism, and so on. And so some intellectuals on the far right decide to change the vocabulary. They borrow from Antonio Gramsci, who was a, a left-wing uh, communist uh, uh, Italian thinker who died in the in the jails of uh, of Mussolini, um, and what they do is by borrowing from Gramsci is uh, to to try and uh, and gain cultural power before gaining uh, political power. And so what they do is they soften their stance, they change their discourse, they don't change their ideology much, but they soften their discourse. And this works. This works by using things like free speech, for example. This works by using things such as cultural racism or what we call liberal racism, rather than actually the kind of hardcore biological racism that everyone has come to uh, to, to denounce in many ways. Uh, and, and this works uh, as well by using laicity in France, secularism, for example, so that, you know, instead of being uh, 
anti-Arab, you become anti-Muslim and you're not against a race anymore, you're against a religion. But of course, you are Islamophobia is racism because at the end of the day, it is racializing a whole group of very different people uh, with particular characteristics, as, as Ruth Bodak said, you know, people who are afraid to, to the West and so on and so forth. So I think what we need to do is, you know, we need to be in a way, we need to stop um, playing reactionaries on their turf. We need to be a bit more clever with the way we go about things. I think they've, they've played us massively. They've, they've played academics, they've played the media, they've played politicians, and now we're speaking on their terms and on their turf. And I think we need to be better at that. We need to stop giving them platforms when we don't need them. You know, for example, if there's a terrorist attack done by a, a white supremacist, we don't need to invite Nigel Farage to talk about it. We don't need to invite Generation Identity to talk about it the way the BBC did, for example, after the Christchurch attack. We need, we need to be much more clever and not give them the platforms that they seek. We need to talk about them, of course, because they are dangerous, but we need to talk about them not too much, not in a disproportionate way, and to also give space to the other alternatives that are more positive and, and that we need in our democracies, really, because our democracies are dysfunctional beyond the rise of the far right, I think. So there's a lot more things that we need to address. That's great. Thank you, Relian. I, I feel like I've got a lot of thinking to do myself. Um, I'm going to turn to some questions from, from the audience because um, I've been hogging it a bit. Um, Barry, I think this one probably falls into your area. Um, the question is, do concepts of right and left still help us to understand political changes or do we need other conceptualizations? You're on mute, Barry, sorry. Thank you. It's uh, it's difficult. I, this, I think. I mean, I think in, there is a sense in 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 which the language of left and right, more generally, I mean, outside the discussions we're having here about uh, far right extremism and populism and so forth, the language of 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 left and right uh, is still current while having less and less purchase upon the uh, dispositions of people to think their, their their own allegiances in these sort of in these sort of uh, uh, of terms. I mean, I'm not for a moment suggesting here that um, whether you're located, for example, in a, in a left or right regime doesn't make a difference to the quality of life, political and, and uh, uh, in other respects. But clearly, there is a whole uh, amount of evidence to, to suggest that the nature of identification and the whole thing about identification as predicating people to vote in one way or another or to have lifelong allegiances in one way or another um, doesn't really have a purchase upon or has increasingly less of a purchase upon the way in, in, in which contemporary polities, not least in the countries we've been talking about um, in the examples used by my uh, colleagues, is, is actually uh, uh, conducted. So. Where one applies that to the question of, of, uh, of populist discourses, um, I mean, it's clear that populism is, uh, uh, is promiscuous in terms of the willingness of, of populist leaders and uh, demagogues to um, take ideas and concepts and slogans from what will more conventionally be understood of left and right. I mean, Trump, I suppose, is uh, a prime example of, uh, uh, of, of this. Whether or not the terms have purchase in an era of what one might call postmodern politics, where relativism um, is king or queen, I'm not, I'm not profoundly sure. I think that we are in, a, in the midst of a shift from a modern politi politics that is configured around the notions almost immutable of left and right such that democratic elitism can only be conceived of as operating in those sort of terms, to one in which the logic of, um, or the dynamics related to identification are changing so radically as to introduce a, a much more liminal field, uh, which is able to be um, preyed upon, canvassed by, all sorts of political forces, some of which we would find agreeable, as Aurelian is, is mentioned, some of which we clearly would not find agreeable. Thanks very much, Barry. Um, Aaron, let's let's um, throw something at you from the from the chat here. Um, I've got someone saying that as far right ideas have been normalized and amplified in the liberal conservative mainstream, ideas from the left have become more and more marginalized, even in so-called progressive places. 
Um, do you have any ideas that could help us bring popular, humane and left wing ideas back into the mainstream policy discussion? So that could mean the US, I guess, but perhaps. Yeah, perhaps. I mean, it's a, it's a huge question. I, I think it draws on the previous one about um, the distinction between right and left. Um, when we talk about that distinction, we have to ask who's asking and why, what are they referring to? Because in a sense, a lot of times we're talking about like left and right don't matter anymore. And you're, ta you're talking about reactionaries who are claiming the left should stand by the working class. But what they mean by the working class are white people who are against immigration. And in fact, um, in, in a sort of classist manner, but you also have the situation where both in, in the UK and in America, um, there was this argument that, and, and an argument because the center of gravity has moved from the center to the far right, that um, in order to get elected from the left, you have to be a centrist politician or more conservative on certain issues like immigration. Um, and what that did was creates a false economy that the, that the left's critique is determined to be a non-vote winner. And that assumes that uh, winning elections is all that matters. Um, and I think the, I think I'm not speaking to the left specifically, but those parties who occupy the left flank in many liberal democracies have moved so far to the center and to the right on so many issues to get those left behind, to get the sort of, um, I guess, undecided voters or to get this, to play, to play into the culture war um, that we've hollowed out the left in terms of parties and political, political establishment. Now that's not, the worst thing in the world, there's also activism and activism needs to be spoken about, not just electoral politics. But I think what we end up having is not just this, this myth that, you know, Bernie Sanders won't win, Biden's the only one who can win. Um, or in the UK, Corbyn can't win, we need a Keir Starmer. And then Keir Starmer comes in and he not only hasn't been tested electorally, but his position seems to be, I don't want to frighten the right. And so you don't even have opposition from the left. You have virtual silence and complicity. And I think that's a really dangerous, dangerous, dangerous situation. And I think it also plays into Biden's um, idea to sort of heal the divisions. Going back to the right left and sort of how we define our, these nations or these countries, um, the societies we live in are not divided based on the two parties. They're not divided by our notions of right and left only. In fact, if you have that idea of healing divisions, if one side is far right or fascist and the other is liberal centrist, I mean, what are your priorities in that society? What about the people who are on the sharp end of that racism, the far right, Trumpism, et cetera, where do they go? And we need a left to represent those people, those people who are harmed by this kind of politics. And that's centrist anti-immigration politics as well as far right politics. And I think in that sense, um, I mean, we have to have a left that is not only working class, support the working class when they're white or when they're racist or sees the working class as racist, but sees it as the most diverse class. We also need a left that, that doesn't play the game of the culture war. It doesn't think that that's the sort of, that's the only game in town. And that may mean, and I'm not, I'm not making any predictions that we need that, that they'll win, but we need opposition. We need resistance to, for example, the crime bill um, here in the UK. Um, and I would say the other thing is, and I think I've spoken about it a little bit, Aurelian has as well, having everything on the, in the terms of the culture war or in reactionary, liberal, conservative terms, limits the horizon of critique and importantly, resistance, but also alternatives. And I think that's how we end the book and Aurelian touched on that in the end of his, uh, his part. Thanks, Ruth, did you want to come in there for a second? Sorry. I'm just I, sorry, I was just, I'm just going to say, I mean, I agree with, 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 with everything that Aaron is, is, is saying. What we've not, done more than touch on in, in, our, in our several discussions here is the, uh, 
the fact that all the politics that we're talking about are operating in a media environment uh, that, uh, that augments and seem to thrive upon uh, hyperbole and allegory. It's, it, it's entirely aestheticized. And that bears upon, I think, the conduct of politics and the, and the, 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 the sense in, 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 in which politics can only be located in particular sites of, of, of activity and activism and ideological um, confrontation. Nowadays, the whole notion of post-truth politics, you can argue, you know, it's, it's not a happy state of affairs. I'm, I'm not suggesting that for a moment. The, the whole notion of post-truth politics speaks to that kind of, of, of dynamic. Now, I'd be very reluctant to talk about a media logic here in terms of how people comport themselves and think about um, the politics that are framed entirely by media. But it clearly, clearly has to come into the, to, to the equation. I and mean, if you take populism, for example, as subsisting on an unlikely combination of cynicism and credulity on the part of disaffected publics who are now as I suggested earlier, le less anchored by the pull of firm identification, then the room for new political or even apolitical forces that speak to this aestheticized dimension of politics becomes that much greater. And those are not for the most part located in traditional and conventional left-right divisions. Could I come in now? Go ahead, me. Thank you. Um, I wanted to bring an example, and I think this is really important. What can we do? Now, uh, Aaron, you said a lot of things we can't do and which are very depressing, and I agree, but there are some things we can do. Um, and I want to bring an example because there are a lot of questions about media also in, in the Q&A. Um, in Belgium, there's a wonderful a piece of research by de Coffey, uh, where she shows that in Bologna, that's the French speaking part of Belgium, uh, there is a social, social democratic party and in Flanders, there's also a social democratic party. Now in Flanders, that social democratic party lost because it, in its program, it accommodated to the far right and sort of started basically overtaking the far right in its racism and anti-immigration, et cetera, et cetera. In, uh, in Bologna, the Social Democrats won. Why was that the case? They agreed and they were able to achieve a cordon sanitaire together with the media so that the whole, all the provocations and scandalizations and all that work, which the far right is always doing to get attention was not reported or just reported on page 12 or something. It wasn't this uh, headline uh, catchers like we had. And of course, the, even the New York Times wrote more about Donald Trump than about Hillary Clinton. We know all that, yeah? So, that is really a very interesting empirical example where together with the media, if you find, if you are able to construct a coalition, uh, you turn the game around. Now I don't, can't, can't uh, sort of predict that we can establish Bologna everywhere, but I think it's something to take note of. And uh, in respect to the working class, etc. What is the working class in most European member states? Migrants. Uh, and I think that is something we have to be very clear about. I'm not as knowledgeable about the UK and the States, but I know, and I spent a year in Sweden studying this in Malmö uh, with the Institute of Migration there. The migrants are not what we think of as the working. Uh, the working class is not what we think of as the workers. It's the migrants, the asylum seekers who have now integrated in Sweden, that's much easier than elsewhere in, in the EU. And uh, they, there is no party which is standing for those migrants. There is no trade union which has incorporated migrants and the precariat. Uh, and I think there is a way forward if those agenda, if, if basically the left finally realized uh, that time has changed yeah, uh, and that all these concepts we used to work with 
have changed. They're not there in that way anymore. Uh, and uh, that is, uh, I think, a very important part of the agenda. And for example, Portugal, uh, which is a very different kind of social democratic uh, party and also government, which did not take the third way, which answers one of the questions, why was the left so uh, did it lose out because it went the third way and did not really provide alternatives in the financial crisis. Uh, but in Portugal, you have a social democratic government which gave migrant citizenship. Uh, so very quickly and also allowed them asylum seekers to work and so forth. So you see very different attempts. Uh, so in that way, I'm not optimistic, yeah? <laughs> but I'm also, I also think there are alternatives. We have to think, like Aurelia also said, there are imaginaries we can think of. And it starts with giving all these professions where everybody applauded now during COVID, higher salaries, for example, and so forth and so on, yeah? So, um, I think there is a lot of thing, points to, to be elaborated and to be thought about with the media in combination also with the social media. There's, uh, but especially with the change in our multi-ethnic, uh, cosmopolitan, whatever, diverse societies where the strata have changed. Uh, and sort of the, the left wing, the traditional left wing has not taken account of that. Oriana, I see you want to come in there. We've got about two minutes left. So yeah, just on what Ruth said, I mean, just to echo uh, what, what she said, I mean, I, that's, yeah, that's exactly what, what we talk about as well in, in the book and in, uh, in some of the work that we've done with Aaron as well, this kind of... The, the, the concept of the white working class completely um, uh, um, whitewashes the working class and the real reality of the working class, which is extremely diverse, which is extremely disillusioned, and yet which en masse does not turn to the far right. And what we try to show uh, in our work, again, you know, mostly based on the US, France and the UK, is that if you look at the, at the working class in these countries, A, it's the most diverse section of the population, but it's also the, the section of the population that abstains the most. So yes, the part of the working class that still votes, which is a small part of the working class, might vote for the far right, but actually the vast majority doesn't vote at all. Uh, and what we look at, and Ruth mentioned it before, we look at the 2014 election, uh, EU election, for example, when when Marine Le Pen won with the Front National in France, when UKIP won with uh, Nigel Farage, when the Danish People's Party won in Denmark as well. In the 2014 election, the working class broadly understood two thirds of them abstained during that election, which means that if in France you have 30% or a third of the working class that votes that votes for Marine Le Pen, but you have two thirds that abstain, it means that one out of 10 workers voted for Marine Le Pen. That means that nine out of 10 didn't. And what I'm thinking is, and you know, that echoes what Ruth said, is like, imagine if the left-wing parties, instead of tapping into the one out of 10 voters who will never come back, they will never come back. And the left, the center left will never beat the right and the far right on issues of migration, on issues of borders and on issues of racism. If instead of focusing on these one out of 10, they focused on the nine out of 10 who either don't vote or still vote for the left and certainly are against the far right, some of them for sure, then I think we would have more optimistic politics and probably more hope to see progressive politics winning in elections. And I think that's similar to what, what probably was happening in Belgium as well, when we actually kind of sidelined the kind of shock and horror that Barry was talking about as well, when this kind of voyeurism about talking about the far right and instead talk about other issues. Mm. And if only we had done that during the Brexit debate here, during the US elections, things would be very different. And hopefully that's what you'll be doing, Laura, during the French elections soon. <laughs> If you give me a hand with that, that'd be great. Um, I think that's a really good good uh, moment to end. Um, it's sort of given us a lot of food for thought, a lot of things that we can all think about in our own lives um, when, we, when we're thinking about this problem. Um, these books are essential lockdown reading. Um, we are, most of us still living in lockdown, so why not uh, inform yourselves a bit more about this topic? It's such a broad theme that we haven't really been able to cover uh, very much grounded in this uh, 90 minute session, but I really hope that you enjoyed it. I certainly um, 
have been left with a lot to think about in my own work and my own life. Um, so thank you all to our speakers, Ruth, Aurelia, and Barry and Aaron. Um, and I hope that that was all useful to everyone. Um, we'll wrap it up now. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.